The Australian night can be a daunting place. Centuries old tales of mysterious creatures abound and in our deepest, darkest forests, strange calls emanate from the gloom. However, for our native wildlife, living under the cover of darkness has been a saving grace, enabling them to escape daytime predators. While this is true, it does make the job of conservationists harder in knowing exactly what exists out there in the blackness. And this is certainly true for some of our nocturnal insects, many of which we know next to nothing about. For one giant of the night, only recent discoveries have shed light on its ecology and its struggle to survive in the remnants of its rainforest habitat. This is the story of the southern pink underwing. I'm Dr. Don Sands. I'm a retired CSIRO scientist, having worked with that organisation all my life. Today I'm standing in a part of Mary Cairncross Scenic Reserve, a primary rainforest, one of the very few patches left on the Sunshine Coast. So the species we're discussing today is the southern pink underwing moth, which is a magnificent moth, an enormous thing. For a moth, its uh, front wings mimic leaves, so it's very well camouflaged during the daytime if it's resting on the bushes. Its hind wings, though, are magnificent in colour. They are black with an enormous patch of pink, which is very showy. These moths occasionally, if disturbed, flash their wings and give us quite a surprise if we bump into them as we walk in the rainforest. But unfortunately, it's a very rare moth and has hardly ever been seen. For a long time, it wasn't known to be here. We discovered the spectacular larva of the pink underwing moth while we were working on another moth, the fruit piercing moths in this rainforest here at Mary Cancross Scenic Reserve. The caterpillars suddenly reared up out of nowhere from being very camouflaged against the stems to show these broad bands on their front segments which look like the teeth of a lizard or some other predator. And in addition to that, two eyes pop out as if they're about to attack. That's probably one of the most spectacular caterpillars known to, to anybody for a moth larva. And so we've gone on to study both the life history and the biology of these creatures as best we can. We then went ahead to name this moth the southern pink underwing moth and to call it Philodes imperialis smithers eye, named after the former curator of the Sydney Museum, Courtney Smithers. We've been studying a group of moths which we call the, uh, the family Arebidae and in that family we've divided them into two groups according to what their proboscis, their feeding parts, look like. We have fruit sucking moths which really visit any old rotting fruit that you put in their path or uh, decaying fruit because they're after the sugars in that decaying fruit. The fruit piercing moths on the other hand which are pests in crops and in fruit of commercial interest, they have a special barb which we recall the, it looks like a, a drill bit which enables it to burrow into fruit. However, the pink underwing moth is one of the sucking moths. It doesn't really damage fruit at all. It only takes advantage of damage already done. The pink underwing moths are really found all over the Pacific, but the southern pink underwing moths are restricted to a small area in southeast Queensland and northeast New South Wales. There's only one food plant for the southern pink underwing moth, and that is the Coronia vine and it's a vine restricted to a small area south of Bat Kin Kin, in other words, south of Gympie and north of about uh, Dorigo. So its restricted distribution aligns with the distribution of the moth, of course. And of course, the climate in that area is obviously the part that's limiting the distribution of both the vine and the moth. So the two are in, uh, interdependent on one another for their existence. It's a vine that grows in primary rainforest and interestingly enough, the, the moths only breed on the lower understory of the plants, in the full shade. We suspect that the larvae are sensitive to ultraviolet light. There are several rainforest insects that breed in rainforest to escape the ultraviolet and bright sunlight, otherwise they simply die. This moth has obviously evolved to breed in rainforest where the ultraviolet rays are low and where it's able to complete development because of the young soft leaves which don't get hardened by the direct sunlight. We then looked closely at the threatening processes and they were much more clear cut and easy to define. Clearing of forest, logging activities, farming and one of the worst things was the invasion of weeds in the understory. 
So weeds getting into the rainforest have become one of the most threatening processes for our understory forest invertebrates as well as many other animals. So when we looked at this closely enough, we put a case together to get this species listed under the EPBC Act. Now under the EPBC Act, the species is listed as endangered and with the agreements between states and Commonwealth that extends now to cover New South Wales as well as Queensland. Now one of the obvious threats is the loss of the food plants or even the loss in density or the quality of the food plants. Therefore, we're proposing that the next steps in recovery will be to propagate more of these coronia vines and they'll be put out into the natural bush areas to encourage breeding on them. Hi, I'm Bonnie Yee. I'm from Native Plants Queensland. This is Coronia multisepalia, and it grows in quite dark rainforests. It is the host plant for the pink underwing moth. Coronia multisepalia has been a challenging plant to propagate. It has very specific requirements. It grows in rainforests, it's a vine, and it flowers high in the canopy for fruit and seed. The seed is very scarce, and striking them from cuttings has been not very successful. The other problem is it has male and female plants, so it needs two parents in order to produce seed. So we have to collect both male and female plants, and I am basically looking for growing tips so that they can put it into tissue culture. To take plants for tissue culture, we need to take some cuttings at the growing points of the vine. So this is a healthy female plant, and I'm looking for these little axle growing tips here. So I'll be getting some cutting material from there and I'll be washing them in 1% bleach to surface sterilise them and then we're taking it into the tissue culture lab. Hi, I'm Anil Ghotke, uh, Managing Director of Plant Biotech. We take actively growing shoot tips called meristem or nodes which are called axillary buds and treat them with sterilants like sodium hypochlorite or calcium hypochlorite to get rid of all the contamination uh, and put them into a defined nutrient media. Now in a defined nutrient media under ideal culture conditions of light, humidity, uh, the cells in the starting material, or we call explant, they start to differentiate and they start to grow actively. Now this growth is exponential growth uh, in tissue culture. Now this exponential growth is, is the one reason which is responsible to mass propagate the plants. And that's why this technique is used for mass propagation of uh, tropical plants. Uh, that's what we specialize in. Uh, and which now uh, is also used for uh, propagating endangered plant uh, where the availability of starting material is uh, very poor. This is the technique which we are planning to use for Coronia wine. So this in turn will uh, help the community to save the southern pink underwing moth from extinction. I'm Lexi Webster from the City of Gold Coast Conservation Partnerships team, which delivers programs to landholders who want to learn more about the flora and fauna on their property and how to go about restoring the native habitat. So private landholders can make a very real difference to the quality and quantity of native habitat available to our local flora and fauna. Often landholders don't know what's on their block. They don't know if it's native or invasive and they don't know how to go about restoring their native habitat. So that's why the city of Gold Coast offers a number of programs to support landholders and to improve their knowledge and skills and set them in the right direction. If you want native fauna, then you need native flora and that's absolutely the case of the pink underwing moth. You know, its caterpillar stage relies on the coronia vine for its food source and that's the case with many other species of butterflies and moths as well. So whether you've got a large patch on your property or only a small patch, the quality of the vegetation actually makes a difference. And in the case of South East Queensland, it's often weeds that landholders uh, have as their primary management issue. In the case of the pink underwing moth, you know, they need really great quality habitat. So if you've got weeds invading the area and taking over the, the coronia or preventing it from establishing, the habitat's not going to be suitable for the moth and you won't see it there. So if you live on a larger block, and you want to learn more about the wildlife that's there or how to go about restoring the native habitat, improving its quality or its quantity, then I encourage you, if you live on the Gold Coast, to contact us and learn more about the programs and the support we can offer you. And even if you're not on the Gold Coast, get in contact with your local council because there's bound to be programs that can support you elsewhere as well. Through my experience in this program, I've been amazed by the on-ground contribution that private landholders have made. And so don't underestimate what you can achieve on your block. I encourage you to get in contact and get involved. You can make a difference. Hello, my name is Wayne Anderson. I'm the landowner of this beautiful property here in Crumman Valley. 
What happened uh, in this particular property, it's uh, 100 acres, uh, and then originally we contacted the Gold Coast City Council in regards to removing the camphor laurels on this property. There's a, a number of camphor laurels invading into the native forests here. Uh, and then from that, we've then developed through with Gold Coast City Council, where we then started participating with Land for Wildlife originally, and then through that process we learnt um, a lot about what is available for assisting landowners in understanding what is on their land and how to manage it in the best way moving forward, especially in the context of uh, native forest regrowth and regeneration. So we went to a couple of courses in regards to that and then through that process we started getting a lot more active in removing a lot of the invasive species and encouraging more the native growth and regeneration. So that was about three or four years ago that we started that and then we've done uh, another round of that again last year and through that process our contractor grant discovered the coronia vine here um, and we also discovered the caterpillar. I do recall when Grant discovered that and he was very, very excited. We got some good photos of the caterpillar and um, you know, the family all come down here because when you excite the caterpillar, it has a very cool looking face on it. And it was very pleasing to see that that sort of endangered species was sitting in here on our property. So one of the aspects with the coronia vine we found was that by clearing those weed species out, it enables that coronia vine to have a better ability to grow and especially in this understory where we are it was quite thick in certain parts so we've been able to clear that out and then encourage the coronia vine to prosper. We see these incredible insects when they're large colourful and gaudy it's a little bit like the koala it attracts people and we regard these as flagship species when they're threatened for carrying the message about conservation without which they have no idea of the interactions so necessary to keep all other species working in a stable environment as well. I've had probably the most enjoyable, challenging and interesting job that I could ever imagine having been involved in. In joining CSRO in 1967 and continuing my affiliation well after retirement through to recent times, I've experienced some of the most wonderful aspects of natural history that I could ever imagine having done. And I hope society as a whole realises the importance of these studies in ecosystem sciences for the future of our environment. Mm -hmm.